så er det vist ved at være her. Det er mig en stor ære og fornøjelse at byde velkommen til, til Lilians phd forsvar Så velkommen til dig. Tak. Jeg skal også byde velkommen til bedømmelsesudvalget. Nu kommer vi til lige lidt. Og selvfølgelig velkommen til ja, publikum, som også sidder her i dag. Mit navn er Tom Nyvang, og udover at fungere som ordstyrer her i dag, så har jeg været øh, vejleder for Lilian, så det er måske derfor, jeg har fået opgave. Og som de sidste ord, jeg skal sige på dansk, lige for et stykke tid i hvert fald her i dag, så skal jeg sige, husk at minde om, at et POD forsvar det er jo en særlig genre. Vi havde ikke stået her i dag, hvis ikke det var fordi, at der var et bedømmelsesudvalg, som synes, at det arbejde, Lilian har lavet, er ganske udmærket. Men ikke desto mindre, så kommer de altså for at presse hende i dag. Nu skal de finde ud af, om der dog alligevel ikke er en grænse for den lyde, hun har og har udviklet. Så derfor så kommer der altså til at blive stillet nogle kritiske spørgsmål. Forventer jeg det? Øh, men det er altså ikke fordi de i udgangspunktet underkender arbejdet tværtimod. Så, so, let me see if I have all in place. Yes, it's this. We have, and now it's returned, the assessment committee over here. We have the chair, Lars Bjerg Andresen, from, and I should look here because it's a different name in English, Department of Learning, Education and Philosophy at Aalborg University, and he's an associate professor. Then we have uh, Vivian Hudson, who's a professor at uh, Lancaster University, and we have uh, Henry West Nicolaisen, who's an associate professor at the IT University of Denmark. In English. Are we not supposed to? Yeah, but are you sure? Because, <laughs> well, <laughs> it is Copenhagen, but It turns up under different names when you try to translate. In a minute, in a minute, Lillian will give a 45 minutes presentation of her work. Then we'll have a short break, 15 minutes. I'll keep track of time. And after the break, each member of the committee will be given 30 minutes to ask questions to Lillian, and she will, of course, have an opportunity to give good answers as well. Let me see, I should remember to say yes. After we've heard the members of the assessment committee, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions for Lillian. But please come and tell me during the, the break that you'd like to ask a question, because then I'll put you on my list. That's all. And by that, I'll give the word to Lillian. Thank you, Tom. And I want to start by thanking all of you for coming here, uh, all of my family and friends who have believed and supported me in, in this work I've been doing, and my colleagues, which has been listening to this for a long time now, and looking forward to hear me today, uh, I hope. And my research fellows for believing and collaborating with me in, in this work I've been, been doing and Tom, my supervisor, for supporting me, giving good feedback. And, of course, the assessment committee for also being here and uh, giving constructive feedback. I will talk about the learning potentials and challenges when we are integrating Web 2.0 in a problem-based learning approach. And uh, I will start by actually trying to look back because I started this work six and a half years ago, so it's quite a long time. Uh, I will give you an introduction to my research questions, at least as they turn out to be. And I would come in on the, the approach that I worked on and how I actually see this. Through my work, I find some themes where potentials and challenges were identified. And in the work between uh, uh, up until now, I actually have been looking a little bit more about some of my analysis 
and the themes that I found and try to bring them a little bit further than actually are found in my thesis. And then I will end up by letting you know what I think I've been concluding with my research or what I see of prospects with it. I will start by also telling the philosophy of my PhD work because I actually uh, believe that we cannot design learning but we can design for learning because I actually predict that or I think that we can't predict what the students actually learn but we can help them, facilitate them, scaffold them by actually designing different kinds of learning uh, and give them a framework to learn within. So throughout my work I've tried to keep this in mind that we actually are designing for learning and not just designing learning. Looking back, it all started back in 2008 where I was as part of my job as an e-learning consultant in the e-learning unit that were at the university at that moment. I was working on implementing Moodle as an uh, e-learning platform at the Faculty of Social Science. And through that work, I identified some need for actually being able to not just introduce the work of Moodle or how Moodle works, but actually also introduce how can we support the teachers even more. At the same time, I was also invited to participate in an EU project working with enterprise architecture uh, together with uh, other colleagues from e-learning lab. And through this work, I used together with them a method called, a collaborative method called COIT. And I also found in this that it had a lack because we were doing workshops, but there was a lack in actually how could we maybe scaffold the teachers even more in actually performing uh, the setup uh, they, that they have designed for. In the same period of time, the AAU management actually had an interest uh, written down on developing problem-based learning, ICT, with a focus on uh, Web 2.0 and e-learning in different interdisciplinary activities. So I went to Michael and said, I would really like to look more into this and see if I could do a PhD on this. And Luckily, Lone and Michael actually agreed upon that, and that's why I got uh, started uh, with this kind of research. In spring 2011, I uh, invited the teachers from social science to actually uh, collaborate with me in a, in a workshop, and uh, based on that, I got three cases to work with. Three of the teachers that were involved in this workshop actually had an idea that they wanted me to scaffold them uh, and collaborate with, the, with them in uh, actually performing this in their lectures. One of the cases was using block for dialogue, looking at, at reflecting on theoretical issues. Another case was giving the, the students the opportunity to have unlimited supervision, kind of 24-7, uh, as long as it uh, took part in an online environment. And I even had the opportunity to have this going on uh, for two iterations due to my part-time uh, PhD. So I had the chance to actually co-edit with the teacher on how to perform the second iteration of this case. And I had a third case who, uh, where the teacher was giving the students the chance to comment online about lectures and content in a kind of uh, same time environment. And the first time I actually met this teacher, 
she, it was as, as in my role of actually an e-learning consultant. And afterward, when she has visited the workshop, then we tried to do it in a more research formal way, actually. So I, I started out uh, by having this interest in actually investigating what kind of scaffolding could take place to actually help these teachers in uh, designing for learning in different ways. And I got this process of uh, I would like to use when I did that. So I grabbed the action research model and looking at that because I believe that this is a process where the practitioners and the researcher have a joint learning process in actually setting this up. So we work as co-researchers and we try to gain knowledge and integrate the different knowledges that we have, both uh, theoretical but also practical, and try to experiment and by that changing practice in different ways. Based on this approach, I uh, developed my kind of scaffolding or research process that uh, was my intention when I started. I had the design workshop where I wanted to introduce the teachers to Web 2.0 and social media. And I presented them with different tensions, but also for them to develop a learning design for them to go on. But instead of just letting them go after this design workshop, I actually intended to follow up by having different sessions with them uh, and discuss these different activities and be part of their uh, ideas and generating of uh, design for learning and facilitate them in the best way I ever could. For my research purpose, of course, I had to look into follow the process that actually took place. And I did some interviews with the teachers. I also uh, presented the students to a small survey um, just to have their uh, expression of, of how they felt these activities were going on. So I ended up by having within two or three iterations, I wanted to see, or ended up with these research questions, I wanted to see how can I actually conceptualize the scaffolding of teachers in, when they are planning and introducing new learning designs, trying to combine problem-based learning and Web 2.0. But also, for that reason, looking at, at what are the learning potentials when you are integrating these Web 2.0 mediated learning in a problem-based learning process. And the challenges that they actually experience when they are uh, integrating this into their practice. My approach could be, or could, could say to be kind of a triple construction. Because I would really like to look at problem-based learning and network learning as a pedagogical approach for this. And the method that I was using was action research and learning design. And within this triangle, uh, you could say, or I believe, my assumption is that the core values in this is collaboration, it's sharing of knowledge, and I believe strongly, and this is also a core value in these three approaches, that knowledge is constructed in social interaction. So you could say that there is a mutual dependency, and these have impact in different ways uh, on each other, depending on how these uh, elements, like where do I start, uh, in each of these, what are the interactions taking place, they move, which also in this has led me in different directions. 
So I believe that this gives a dependency between the three approaches, and it could have an impact on each other in different ways. So I got the role of actually navigating uh, as a scaffolder or researcher in this uh, interdisciplinarity. And I will say that I didn't feel like this guy, but uh, I think that it shows that we actually, in, in different ways, are depending on each other. And that collaboration is quite important in situations like this. Based on my uh, empirical uh, data that I got from following the teachers and interviewing them, I ended up identifying different themes. And I ended up with an overall, so far, of nine themes that I, where in which I actually found different kinds of potentials, but also different kinds of challenges. I have just mentioned some of the potentials that I found here, uh, and you will see in the list in the folder in front of you uh, all of the potentials that I actually have think that I have identified uh, in my research. But some of the things that I found potentials within is the different ways of actually doing documenting and maintain a shared knowledge as it was one of the core values here. And I believe, and I have found that actually uh, it's a way of developing the skills and competences of the students, which also are in line with what the teachers actually find. And I would like to draw on an example of one of my, uh, from, from my data, because one of the cases was using this block to actually do uh, reflection on theoretical issues and combining them with different kind of cases. And she was pretending or no, she was having an activity where she actually moved from doing it in an oral way, like having the students to present in lectures and then moving to making them do it in a writing, doing it by blocking. Uh, and she believed that it would give them some skills in actually doing communication and working with collaboration more than uh, it was when they were uh, speaking together and working in groups because uh, they could comment on each other and make more reflections. She was working towards a workshop at the end of the uh, lectures. And she, give, she gave the students a chance to actually use this process by scaffolding them uh, throughout the lectures up until the end where they had this workshop. It was a two-day workshop. What turned out was that she actually got aware that there was it was very difficult to actually evaluate the students when you were working with this written uh, blog instead of just listen to their presentations and try to have a discussion in that way. So because which block did she have to choose when she was presenting them in the lectures? So was she doing it? by letting the students document their work, or was she actually doing it by making them evaluate in different ways? That was quite a struggle when I talked to the teacher. What also happened was that in the workshop at the end, the teachers actually, or the students actually, asked for uh, a time extension to work more in the block uh, when the, when the workshop ended, they wanted a week more to actually gather all the data that they actually wanted because 
they saw a benefit of using it in exam. So for the purpose of the teacher, something different actually happened instead of what she actually intended with this activity. So she also found that this was actually quite time consuming to figure out what to deal with when you are working with this written uh, part instead of the spoken. So it was a chance to actually balance the alignment between the learning objectives that she put up and the learning activities that she had and how am I going to evaluate this, that I, uh, this activity that I set up. So it's a combination of both potentials but also facing different kind of challenges. I have also only put some of the challenges here and um, some of them are the role that the teacher actually have and the ability to develop competences accordingly. Also, as mentioned before, the balance between documentation and evaluation. How do we work with this way? And time has been a factor in, I think, all of the cases that I actually work with because it takes time. Uh, and it can either be time giving or time consuming. Another example from my data was the unlimited supervision going on, where the first iteration showed that uh, the teacher actually thought, and I, I mean thought, that he gained time because it was easy and the students weren't asking that many questions in the online form. But from what he actually would have liked them to do and what he expected them to do, they didn't, get, they didn't do because there wasn't going any theoretical or methodology uh, dialogue going on at all. So it was more time consuming or it would have been more time consuming if he actually wanted the students to do the things that he intended with this because he would like them to, to have this theoretical discussions and uh, methodology discussions in a kind of networked environment instead of actually having it uh, just uh, with the different groups so that they could gain different things from each other as a group or a class with 80 persons instead of just a group in four or six persons. So this communication as, as a factor as well, as a potential, is that the written word could, are kept in different ways. But the spoken uh, could sometimes be an easier way to cope with these things. So the unlimited supervision, the case with that actually showed a limitation in the interaction going on with the students when he moved from the more spoken meeting uh, perspective of learning to the more written one. And the teacher with the block case as well found that actually it was hard to have the time to uh, look for misunderstandings or uh, come up with uh, an answer to the block writing that the, uh, that the students actually did. So having this, um, yeah, having this kind of um, written thing actually gives some challenges and the spoken thing or the spoken word have some strength in this way of interacting. Again, and time is a factor. All of this or, and my themes I tried, uh, I tried to look at and I would I tried to think how can I actually put this or um, gather them in, in different uh, headlines on this and I came up with this 
model. Uh, because I actually think that it has different uh, didactic values. And you as a teacher needs to do didactic consideration when you are designing for learning. So working with this uh, and trying to see the different themes within this, I was in the conditions. Uh, getting into three levels uh, seen from, from the perspective. And an important thing is to actually consider the conditions necessary to succeed in designing the learning and the different levels of interaction. So one of the issues found in my data is how the institution actually cope with this uh, integration of ICT into uh, teaching practices. How do we work with that? And another one will be we are working very much in teacher teams and, and collaborate among teachers. And it's quite important to have a common understanding of the learning objectives that are actually taking place. So have a discussion and a dialogue of, of, on these but also have an awareness of the skills and competences that you, the teachers and the students bring into the learning settings uh, and have a, a, a knowledge about how they can contribute in different ways. What kind of academic skills are we trying to develop uh, in this like the unlimited, unlimited supervision who actually also try to gain uh, networking and collaborative skills for the students just besides getting supervision. So in, in some of the cases, I believe that many of the factors that were intended actually didn't happen in that sense. For the configuration as a headline, I think that it's important to look at the pedagogical approach and the scope on how to deal with this. For instance, uh, who is in control? And just regarding Olbo University, I've worked with this uh, model where it's uh, presenting uh, some continuous working with problem-based learning like problem, the work process and the solution within who is in control, either the teacher or the participant. And throughout my research I found that here at the university we actually have this PBL AAU model and we are working very well with it in uh, project work. But how are we actually dealing with it when we are talking about courses and active learning and taking into consideration this um, uh, pedagogical approach and, and scope of problem-based learning? And therefore I have put the slides more within the middle than within the, um, the participant controlled approach of this. So designing for learning and considering the pedagogical approach and the kind of activities that you want to is one of the ways to actually work with this configuration and planning uh, and how you actually work with documentation or evaluation uh, and the examples that I've been given uh, before. And of course, from my approach, the technological possibilities will also be a factor. And you could say that um, that's, that's some of the things that might have changed uh, in this is the actually 
having access or being online kind of 24-7 in working in environments or online environments. And which not happened before in that sense. When we were using the blackboard, we were not able to stand in front of it 24-7. We were there when we were there. And what kind of factors or uh, impact does this actually have that we are online 24-7 and able to work with this? Um, again, the factor of time becomes important. Another issue is the personal environment uh, versus the educational environment. Two out of three of the cases that I work with was actually taking place on Facebook. And that set up a mix between personal environment and educational environment. But it was actually a wish from the students. Um, and it turned out that it actually worked. But it gives some challenges for how to actually frame the uh, intentions that you have with your, uh, with your learning to deal with this. Because uh, do we actually want a mix of this educational or personal learning environments, seen from the teacher's perspective, at least? So, the ability to actually scaffold the teachers and develop an awareness of the challenges, challenges when you actually integrate C ICT tools is quite important uh, when you deal with, uh, with this. So back to my model, which I probably should have showed here, but all around it would be framing actually the ability to develop the teacher's competences so that they themselves are able to combine both the conditions, the configuration, and the technological possibilities for taking into account the learning objectives that they want to have, the learning activities, and at least the ability to actually handle all of these both technologically, pedagogically, and communicatively, because they are quite good in the pedagogical way, but combining it with the technological, technological way could be a challenge in, in different ways. So taking a view on this actually showed or led me to this model of scaffolding. And I believe that uh, it's quite important in different ways to have some technological, pedagogical persons to support you or scaffold the teacher's process of integrating Web 2.0 mediated learning activities. And I also believe that this is an issue that we often forget or at least not uh, in, uh, support very well in this way. Also because the teachers actually are experts on their domain and for that needs to scaffold the students in their learning process. <coughs> and by combining it with technology there could be a lack in actually having these intentions going on. So this model trying to illustrate that there should be a progress over time in actually trying to scaffold the teachers so that they get uh, knowledge about uh, integrating ICT with a pedagogical purpose <coughs> and trying to make the reflections uh, for the potentials but also for the challenges going on. And also, the ability to know when to break down the scaffolding parts so that uh, it's, uh, it's more or less becoming a more natural part of it. And I think looking further on scaffolding, 
uh, you could say that we are working with two kinds of scaffolding. The external scaffolding, which was the one that I saw when I implemented the Moodle environment and the one that I saw when I was working at the EU project, that we instruct teachers or learners in the use of ICT and maybe even in a specific platform or a specific ICT tool. And then the scaffolding is removed and the learner stand on his or her own feet in the further process of actually learning how to use this or integrate this in their learning environment and their learning practice. I would like the more transformative scaffolding where we work with a movement from this externalized to internalized scaffolding, where we actually look at a process where scaffolding supports uh, this transformation taking place from external, like a joint learning process, to the more internal scaffolding, uh, so that it becomes a natural part of how teachers are thinking on in their design for learning. So looking at these two perspectives kind of lead me back to the beginning where I saw the need of scaffolding the teachers more than only having the external scaffolding taking place and to make them able to use the technology combined with the pedagogical approaches in a more active way. And just to give another, it has some different text in it, but it's how I actually tried in my work to scaffold uh, the teachers. So this is how it looks from my perspective as a researcher uh, and a scaffolder in the design process. So what I actually did in my role was that I also try to, to ex observe how they, this learning activities actually was integrated and the process that the students actually took place. I, th I have just one slide back uh, or left. And this is this one. Because if I try to look at this in different ways, how could a tool or a media like Facebook actually be put into this in, in, uh, in looking at this? And I think Facebook as a tool or as a media could give some, some different uh, setups. It's a... Uh, getting a bit blurred between the study and the social life and the educational life and the private life, which uh, needs to be taken into consideration. And for configuring out as a teacher, as the designer for learning, how to deal with this, you need to have different kind of pedagogical consideration uh, in what can you actually gain from taking in Facebook. And how can Facebook be used? Because compared to a virtual learning environment like the Moodle environment, the Facebook mainly uh, adds up for uh, dialogue and actually information uh, and not many other activities than that as such. So the conditions is also how do the institution actually look at things like Facebook or media like Facebook integrated into this uh, learning practice. And I also believe that there are some ethical issues in using the Facebook environment in this because you don't have the institutional control of media like Facebook. And you don't have um, 
the teacher get a role on actually diverting between the private and the professional or domain expert role in this way. So I think putting Facebook into this gives a lot of challenges in different ways that you need to consider as a teacher. I think uh, that was it. Thank you. Now we have a 15 minute break. I'll be very harsh and make you get back in here so that we can start in exactly 15 minutes. Please remember if you have uh, questions that you would like to ask afterwards, well, as part of the defense, you don't have to ask me if you want to talk to me later today. I'm sure she has people taking care of that. Uh, but if you would like to ask a question as part of the defense, then let me know during.